On average, it takes about 30 days for a person to break their New Year's resolution. So if saving money was on your 2024 list, your odds aren't looking that great. Luckily, I have a 100% guaranteed way to save you money this year. Just switch to Mint Mobile. For a limited time, wireless plans from Mint Mobile are $15 a month when you purchase a three-month plan. That's unlimited talk, text, and data for $15 a month. All plans come with unlimited talk, text, and high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and bring your phone number along with your existing contacts. Ditch overpriced wireless with Mint Mobile's limited-time deal and get premium wireless service for just 15 bucks a month. To get this new customer offer and your new three-month unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash WCB. That's mintmobile.com slash WCB. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash WCB. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. Introducing Royal Caribbean's newest ship, Icon of the Seas, the ultimate family vacation. The ultimate six slides, eight neighborhoods, zero compromise vacation. The ultimate never done that, can't wait to do it vacation. The ultimate chillin' by a different pool every day of the week vacation. This is the Icon of Vacations. Icon of the Seas, arriving in 2024. Book today. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry Bahamas. Well, this sucks. So what's up, man? How's things? It's been a while. Yeah, yeah. no, they're good. Just uh, living through the, the winter droll, you know, gray and rainy. and But it's been yeah. pretty nice. Um, today, it, it felt like spring. I took the dog out, you know, for some walks and stuff. And the grass is starting to grow up in the yard a little bit kind of early. But yeah. It's, it's yeah, good. it's... Uh... Is it mild down there too? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's freaking crazy mild here for January. But I mean, we we already paid for it. I mean, we had record snowfall in November, and then like the we were blasting temps all over with this cold weather we had in December. So yeah, we we got some of that too. You know, it blew down to us through that Fraser Valley, and definitely definitely cooled things down a bit. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. So everything's good, eh? Yeah. Yeah. So. Let me ask you about that goat behind you. Is that like a draw or is that over the counter? Uh, that one is, uh, that's over the counter. Man, that's awesome. Yeah, we have lots of uh, OTC um, opportunities up here for goats. Well, for everything, really. I mean, there isn't there isn't anything you can hunt other than doll sheep that you need to draw for. That's awesome. Yeah, grizzly bear. It was grizzly bear and doll sheep were the things you needed uh, draws for. And then obviously grizzly bears are gone, but um, yeah. So, but. Yeah, it's good. I, I got a doll sheep uh, a while back, so the only thing I'm missing is a stone sheep and a grizzly bear. That's pretty sweet, man. Not too many people have those mountain goats. My dad got drawn for a mountain goat in Washington uh, six years ago, seven years ago, and he ended up getting one. That's a once-in-a-lifetime thing in Washington. Yeah, I think down there, well, I even know like the southern end of BC, there's not as much as there is up north, and that goat that's behind me, that's a northern goat. I have shot other ones down here. They're not nearly as well, they, I shouldn't say not nearly. They're just typically not as big as the ones up north. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that uh, I remember, if I remember correctly, it's like 75% of the goat population in the world is like the mountain goat is in British Columbia. So uh, there's a lot. Uh, that, the numbers could be off. But. So you're out cougar hunting today? Uh, I was going to go today. I ended up going a couple of days ago, but uh, today I actually went. So I do real estate and I had to go show a couple yeah. houses. Oh, yeah. So yeah. Got postponed, but that's okay. I'll, uh, I'll make it out in the next few days. Yeah. What's, uh, what are you guys using for you guys using dogs or? No, we can't, can't use dogs. Um, oh, so oh, that, right. you can't down there. That's right. Yeah. We, we, they, they canceled that in what? 95, I think. And so my, my only recourse is, well, people who are good at it, I've noticed they they go up in the snow and they'll find tracks and then they like basically hike them down. Yeah. Um, but for me, I've just been calling, um, I'll go yeah, out yeah where i i bear hunt lots of times because i'll have cougar all over my cameras and uh i'll just sit and i'll use an electronic caller usually when i'm calling for cougar though because that you know they pick up on movement so quick yeah and if you can just you know push play on the on the deal and only push a button now and again i think that really helps out 
chances. Yeah, they're sly, man. They're super oh, sly. Yeah. I uh when I was whitetail hunting, I was going in to check one of my trail cameras that's close to my blind. And uh I'm walking up to my trail camera. I had my bow strapped to my back and I had my snowshoes on. I'm hiking in and uh I hear this rustling around and I, I was like, Oh, I thought maybe it was one of the deer that had been cruising around there. And I look up and then I see the back of a cat and I instantly thought it was a bobcat because there's tons of bobcats around that area. And then right as soon as my eyes focus, I realized it was a cougar and I'm like, Oh shit. <laughs> so I like just go back to doing what I was doing. And all of a sudden I, on a, there's a tree a little closer to me. I hear some rustling around and I hear a growl and a growl at me. And I turn around and another cougar hops out of the tree, hops down and then takes off. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? One of my buddies, uh, an older guy, he's like, I don't know, mid 60s, and he was elk hunting with us so three, four years ago. But he hopped on this little rocky outcropping. And when we go elk hunting, there's there's lots of predators, there's lots of cougar and stuff like that. But he looked down and on the rock, there was five cougars lined up wow. sitting there. See, I like, thought they were I thought they were really territorial. And like when I seen that one cougar jump down, I never expected to see another one because like we have quite a bit of cougars up here. So you're out in the bush, like I've I've come across them, like like scared them and stuff. Like I've seen them before, and I've hunted them. I hunted them with dogs, and I've hunted them just doing the same thing, running down tracks and calling. I've never seen them like I've never seen two full like two adult cats hanging out together. And the funny thing was, they were on there was an elk kill right there. They took down an elk. Huh? That's so. crazy. Yeah, I've only seen them individually um, by a kill or you know just walking down the road. I haven't seen a group of them, with the exception of. My trail cameras have i haven't but. yeah yeah th that's a good point too because you always see glimpses of trail cameras footage like not mine in particular but other people that post stuff and you'll see two cats cruising around together so i had i had three three at once last year that was my record walking along at oh, night yeah yeah man it's uh yeah it's tough it's funny that guys run him down so anyway so after i seen the second cat i was like oh man like he he just left so i quickly Took my pack off, grabbed my bow, knocked an arrow, clicked my boots and my snowshoes off and um, threw them in the snow. And I was going after those. I went after the cats and I tracked them for a while. And uh, I ended up treeing the one of them. And he ended up jumping. He ended up jumping out of a tree that I walked past. But huh. I never found the other one. And by the time, obviously, you know, by the time he was he was gone, by the time I, I, I was using my, my bow at, it would have been really hard to get a shot in that thick shit that he was in, even if he would have stopped it. But oh yeah, that's yeah, crazy how they walk like that. No, you know they just hunker yeah. down right by. Yeah, well, and you know you often wonder, like once you have an experience like that, you're like, man, I wonder how many times since, like, how many times they're obviously they're they've been cruising around there. How many times I've walked past one, or you know, one has watched me sitting up in a tree, just looking down at me. Like you often wonder that after you see them creepy I thing trees now all the time when i'm elk hunting just looking for cougar yeah like, i mean I, if someone's watching me they're probably thinking like what is this guy doing and i'll be like <laughs> yeah. I'm looking yeah yeah i do that but i don't do it in the summer i should i guess but uh yeah i don't know i don't my, i have a buddy and we talked about it on the show a while ago and yeah he got uh he got charged by a cougar not far from where i bumped those two cougars so there's but man there's a lot of like this the, the southern end of british columbia there's there's a ton of cougars so there's just there's no natural predators for them right so um and there's not a lot of people hunting them i mean there is some guide outfitters around here who run dogs but even even that i mean like those guys are getting older and they're just not they're not doing it as much and yeah hard on the deer oh yeah big time yeah yeah anyway so that kill i set a trail camera up on that kill where they had that elk but they never came back to that kill. Surprise. Huh. I thought they would have came back before. Yeah. My son and I went in there like, man, like three or four weeks later. Yeah, three weeks later. And we went and checked the trail cam pictures. And uh, we dug the elk up because it had been buried in snow again. But yeah, there's it was still how they left it. Huh. Yeah, it's crazy. Funny. Yeah, yeah. That's me too. But it was, uh, there, there was a pack of wolves cruising around because we had them. Like we parked my sled. And then we hiked into where it was. And then when we were hiking out, we could hear the wolves howling away and they weren't far off. So we started, I got them howling, but it sounded like they were coming in, but those things too are pretty sly once they, they're hard to fool. Oh yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. they ain't stupid. No, 
no they're, not, they're yeah the dumb ones end up dead you know yeah that's for sure i know my brother and i we were going out uh we were out man, a couple of years ago and we had the same scenario going in and it's funny like i there might i don't know if the pack did it deliberately but there's like one wolf that would run out and like check he'd run out out of the tree line and check and then run back in and then like run up a bit and then run back out and run back in and it was the same wolf i don't know if if that was his job i don't know how it works internally in there in the pack but i know they're smart and you know i wouldn't put it past them if they have a, a guinea pig like that yeah he drew the short short straw that day yeah <laughs> yeah you run out and see if we get any bullets winging off you <laughs> yeah yeah so man you know it's what's the date today december we're in the middle of january and i got uh i got the bad case of the bears man i'm that's all i can think about right now is spring bear I don't know. That makes two of us. I mean, like, go, just going on that hike, you know, for our, the the walk with the dog today, I was just looking at the grass. I know it's coming up. It's kind of warmer. I'm like, oh, man, it's killing me not being able to go out. And then the other day when I went cougar hunting, I I, I, I was hunting in an area I like to spring bear hunt when I would get drawn. And it just, you know, brings back memories. And, and uh, some of the trees I took photos of in my first book, those are long dead. And a couple of them snapped. They had a really bad windstorm the other day. And, and when I walked through there, a couple of them had been completely snapped in half. And it's just, mm-hmm. yeah, I, yeah, I feel you. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. I mean, it's such a bummer what's going on down there. I mean, yeah, uh, with your guys' spring hunt, man. Yeah. Now, it sounds like there's going to be some litigation happening. So hopefully that at least lets them know that they're on notice. Yeah. What, ha- what, uh, I had Charles on, uh, we were talking about the Montana grizzly bear getting del- delisted. Is that still going on? Yeah. So that's still being considered. But so, like, I think Wyoming tried it a couple of years ago. They got it delisted. They, even sold uh like a draw hunt so you could put in if you got drawn they you know they're gonna draw like 150 tags or something like that and if you got drawn you could go hunt and then right before the hunt somebody issued uh you know uh, a legal situation where they want to sue them and then you know one of the the favorable judges says okay yeah they can do that so then the hunt got stopped but people had already been drawn and you know they were getting yeah, yeah. It was just like days before the hunt was supposed to happen so it wouldn't surprise me if montana has the same problem um, but hopefully those judges just tell those people to go fly a kite, but I don't know if they will. Yeah. Yeah. Charles was saying that it, it's not even about, you know, like this isn't even about the hunting opportunities. It's just about getting that animal. There's, there's a lot of other, there's a lot of other issues of having an animal on a deal, like having it on a list of protected, protected species when it's, it's not an endangered species so yeah for sure and they you know they keep bumping up the where they want it to be you know at first it was this number and it reached that right. number right you know now it can be managed so they're like oh no it's got to be this number this number this yeah. you know yeah we yeah. know that it's not for anything scientific it's because they don't want the hunt yeah yeah and it's it's funny that you know that they just keep going back to that they just immediately assume that you know everybody want like there's just ulterior motives behind everything and it's just you know that they just don't they have just it's funny how they just have such a hard time seeing that we want what's best for the landscape you know just because we're hunters and you know we don't buy our meat in a grocery store well we, we we do but we prefer not to um that we don't care about the animals on the landscape i, I was told this week that uh, as a hunter i was addicted to meat and so i was gonna, <laughs> gonna pull it from uh, an anti an anti-hunter it was, i was laughing yeah it, I, I had a conversation with somebody it was funny because I, I, for the longest time, I was just under the impression that all anti hunters are vegans, right? Like they just don't eat meat. And I, I got, I got schooled on the fact that no, that's not it at all. And I was totally blown away how somebody can be so naive as to think, you know, like it, it's okay to kill something. And like, it's way more inhuman, like inhumane to buy something like what happens to say a cow or a chicken than what happens to a deer or a bear that we shoot. Like, it's just funny how they their thought process automatically it's fine for them to buy it in the grocery store just because they're you know they're so removed from the animal itself that but for us who are a lot closer to the animal it's not okay but i feel the same way when you see like uh uh a screen over a picture of an animal being skinned they're like oh this is graphic you know but if i took a steak out of a styrofoam plastic wrap thing, yeah. it, oh no that's fine but you know it's I, yeah, I can't really, take- yeah exactly yeah pulling this the plastic wrap off a piece of meat is the same thing as pulling the skin off it <laughs> it's just like <laughs> whatever makes them feel better i guess that's right so that's anyway it. dude 
Yeah. So anyway, dude, what I kind of want to talk to you about is just because I got, you know, I'm, I got bare brain right now. I want to talk about preseason scouting and um, your book, the first chapter of it. That's exactly what it talks about. Yeah. Preseason scouting. So I kind of just want to go through that, you know, uh, for the folks that are listening, just to, you know, get these things on their mind now, rather than, well, you know, I'd like to get you back on when it's actually bear season, but by that time it's, when bear season is open, your preseason scouting really isn't doing all that, all that much. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, I, I, I got you. No, no problem. We can talk about preseason scouting and. So, but you know. so, uh, you know, no offense or nothing here, but when you guys had the spring bear hunt, what were you doing in the spring? Like, say you had a draw, what were right now, what would you be doing? Uh, so yeah, let's just say if I got drawn, I would be going to that area and, and let's just say it's a new area that I haven't hunted before. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, if I had access to it, I would, I would be walking the gravel roads. I would be kind of looking at maps. And so like, actually when we had spring bear hunts, we would get maps from the Department of Fish and Wildlife or from the logging companies. And on those maps, it showed the area that you were allowed to hunt because you couldn't hunt the whole state. It was a very select area. And they would say, hey, these are the these are the areas that we are having problems with bear stripping trees. And so I actually I would focus on those areas because they were kind of directing you already to those areas. But let's say that you don't have that option. I would still be going to um, gravel roads. I would be walking along. I'd be looking for. Douglas fir trees that, you know, I always say, put your hands together as two C's, make them touch. And you, that's the size of the tree that you're looking for. Maybe expand it a little bit, but you know, that's the, the size of the tree that you're looking for around the trunk. And I would be um, looking for orange and red trees uh, on areas that, you know, on like a hillside or if I could look down, if I could see orange and red trees, that shows me that those trees were stripped um, two years ago or the or three years ago or the year prior. And then, you know, you can almost watch the the trail of the bear on, on things like that. So say that there's a hillside and there's there's like red dots or orange dots that go down and those are all stripped trees. That's the that's the trail that the bear did as he stripped those trees. Um, so that's a big clue for me. It's like a, a red and orange flag. And so as I'm hiking or driving, even in the area, if I see stuff like that, I'll pause and you know I'll mark it on my phone or or take a mental note and be like, yeah, I definitely want to hit this area uh, when season starts because down yeah. here, the thing they strip those trees left and right. Right. Um, and if, if that's not an option or whatever, if you guys don't have a lot of trees where you're spring bear hunting. Um, Try to figure out, you know, where the sun's going to be shining. So you want to find those those grassy areas that are just going to do the first green up. Because if they don't have those trees to strip, then the next thing, and that's pretty universal no matter where you go. The first thing that grows in the spring is grass, pretty much. And that's the first thing they're eating. That's the first main food source available for bear. And what makes the grass grow? Uh, rain and sunshine and so you want to find that sunshine where it's where it's hitting along the side of the hill or or uh, old decommissioned logging roads where the trees aren't grown up super tall you know that that sun's able to get down in there try to find those little those little areas yeah yeah so that's that'd be the first little spot i'd be looking at what about uh what about like den activity do you find like do you find like do you find bears will use the same den from the year previously or they'll den in the same area? Like, have you, have you noticed a lot of that? I haven't followed like a bear specifically, you know, that goes to a den. And then the next year I see if it went to the same one, but it, yeah. you know, it wouldn't surprise me similar to like a bird's nest. You know, if, if you knock down a bird's nest in your on the corner of your house and then next year a swallow builds another nest there, mm -hmm. it's like naturally a good spot. Mm -hmm. And there's certain, certain logs, certain holes in logs or, or hillsides holes in the hillsides that bear just naturally kind of gravitate to and so but I, I'll, I'll check out those areas right. um and you know that that is something in the early spring i won't hunt the dens but i'll hunt around those areas so, you know avalanche shoots stuff like that um kind of up high where the bear might be coming out or they're you know they're coming out and they're eating um mm -hmm. and then they go back in or you know they're just kind of hanging around those areas until it really starts to warm up a little bit and then they kind of abandon those dens and off and yeah on. yeah because that's a lot of thing a lot, that's one thing i don't think a lot of guys realize is that the den activity those bears they're not actually they don't actually crawl in there and fall asleep and wake up and all of a sudden it's winter and get out of their den and you know or sorry it's spring and get out of their den and then they you know they're good for the summer they actually they'll wake up move around 
And then even when they're den, when, you know, the snow starts to melt, they'll come out of, out of their den, look for food, go back in their den, and they don't fully leave that den right away. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And my, my brother, he, um, he shot a bear a couple of years ago and it was really cool when we were tracking it, there was this rocky hillside and we were looking for the bear. We, I, there was just rock after rock, little crevices all throughout this whole area. And so that's another area I'm going to check again um, this fall, if I haven't tagged out enough to see if, uh, you know, if there's bear in that area, because there was bear when he was in there and it looks to me like a good denning area. That's, yeah. that's kind of me. So, yeah. 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 And that's a good point you make too, is that if there's something, if there's a reason the bears are denning there to begin with, and like what I've found is that in the springtime, the bears always seem to be in a specific location. They, they are downward, like there, there's ac easy access to water and there's a lot of green vegetation like it's where there's the sun has hit those pockets the most and it seems like they like to den closest like in my experience anyway they like to den in areas where th those are going to be easy accessible they don't they're not denning in an area where you know in may there's still going to be three feet of snow they're denning and i find they're denning in the areas where there's a little where you know when they get out of their den there's actually there's vegetation around they don't have to hike they don't have to walk you know 20 miles to get to any green to any areas where it's greened up already yeah Yep. And, you know, I, I don't use it. I, I don't use it as much as a lot of people. I have used uh, e-scouting like Google Earth. That's it kind of dates me because that's what I used was actually like Google Earth on my computer. So that's what, 2009 or something when I was kind of looking at that. But, you know, you can it, it, it helps to get kind of a feel for the area that you're going to be hunting. You can at least look at it on Onyx or whatever app you might have check out the topography and 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 look for those little i call them park areas or other people call them park areas too where it's just like little patches of of grass or open uh -huh. area there are going to be you know they're going to be feeding along those edges and in those fields in that early spring and so um those are real important spots to check out yeah and there's an if you go into google earth and actually um mark Livesey um in his course he teaches you how to how to do like how to check the historic like go back and historically check google and like if you go into there and you go on your spot you you'll actually be able to see like you'll be able to click on the historical data of you know when the camera's flying the satellite's flying over taking pictures and you can actually go back and see and you can get pictures it, you know in some areas if you're lucky you can get pictures of springtime and you can actually see like historic like you'll get a picture of the one camera say in 2017 will be in the in november and there'll be full of snow there but then you know in two years previous to that you'll get a picture of what it looked like in the springtime when you know in in april where the and then you'll be able to actually see which areas have greened up like which areas where the snow has melted first and that's a good place to to, to target to completely agree those that historical data little, little slider that you can do that can be pretty handy yeah um, and, yeah to to scout with for sure yeah and, and like i've never i've never used it for bears and actually just it actually just dawned on me when you were talking about that when you when you said uh, when you aged yourself there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, and yeah, you know, I guess like so south facing south facing slopes. Th those are the slopes that get a lot of sun because it you know the sun rises in the east, sets in the west. Mm -hmm. That south is doing a lot. So if if you're going to an unknown spot, kind of focus on those. Um, but also don't get hung up on those. Like uh, talking to a guy who was going to Montana. He was from Texas. He was going there blind on a spring bear hunt, and he ended up tagging a brute of a bear. But I kind of given him that advice. But I also said, hey, don't don't get hung up on it. If you're not seeing stuff on those south facing slopes or whatever, try a different spot. Try a different strategy. So you know, bear are they're wanderers. They're 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 not necessarily set in their ways, and so sometimes you got to adjust. Yeah, for sure. And it all depends, I think, too, is like where we're like to add to your point there, like in British Columbia, if you're not seeing if you're going out hunting bears in the springtime and you're not seeing any bears, there's probably not a lot of bears in that area you are because like there's no there's no reason you shouldn't be seeing black bears uh, in B.C. if you're going out hunting them, especially in the springtime. I mean, like from four o'clock, three thirty till dark, uh, man, like you, you're going to run out of fingers on your hand. So it sounds like a dream. I really do need to get up there and, and yeah, man, I'm telling you anytime uh, you want to come up, we can go do some steelhead fish and we can, uh, you can teach me how to call bears like a champ and uh, <laughs> yeah, it'd be a lot of fun. They put the pressure but... on me. <laughs> no, never be a good time. So you, that picture of that bear I sent you last year, remember that big blockhead, big yes. cinnamon bear. Um, 
I never seen that bear in that area before, but doesn't mean that he hasn't been because I only seen him on my trail cameras. And I mean, you know, they, there's a lot of ground to cover with your trail cameras. So it doesn't mean that he hasn't been there all the time. But do you find it's like bears are they're pretty territorial? Like in the springtime, you find do you find like it kind of goes back to the question I already asked you, I guess. But like, do you find that if if a bear, if you hunted a bear, like say that bear in particular that I was chasing, what do you, what your opinion is that that bear will be back in that spot again? Like, or not in that exact spot where he was obviously on my trail camera, but you know, in this specific region, there must be something there that he, he knows is there that's dragging him to it. I, I would say it's a, it's a safe bet. So like, for example, there's this, there's this one spot I'm, I'm hunting in the last couple of years and I've, I've ran into this chocolate bear a couple of times, like three times, three, four times. And I haven't sealed the deal with him yet. Last year I had him at like 75 yards, but I had my bow with me and he was broadside, but it wasn't a shot. I don't shoot that far with my bow. Not, you know, not something I would personally take. Uh-huh. Other people can shoot it. That's fine. But for me, you know, I like, I want like 40 or less. But anyway, my, my point is, is I've seen him in that same area in the spring. So there's something in there, whether he's denned up close by or he just likes that food source. And I've also found like trees that he's marked, or I, I assume that he's marked. There's, there's, um, a chocolate air on those trees um so i i would say it's, it's a safe bet yeah i would yeah. definitely that area and, and set up some more cams and try to find that guy because he's a tank yeah he's that, a nice bear man uh, i was yeah and you know the funny thing is i i had i you're we're allowed two bears up here and i i tagged out on a on a good sized black bear and then i passed up on a lot of bears trying to find that bear again and i hunted a lot of days looking for him and man i could just I just could never catch up with him. And I don't know. I didn't, I didn't after I had, a, I had him on our trail camp pictures a couple more times, but you know, I think he kind of, I think as the warmer temperatures, as everything started warming up more and more and more, I think he kind of left the area and just like expanded his, you know, his territory. It, it, it It's funny though, real quick, because you asked me if I thought bears were, were territorial and I, I, I know that they are. But, you know, because they'll mark their territory yeah. with scratch and all that other stuff. But I also think, and I'm not a scientist, but this is just my observation. I, I feel like they're tolerable of other bears when the food is plentiful. Because I don't know how many times I've looked at like a berry, you know, blueberry patch. And there's like one, two, three, four bear in this, you know, 300 uh, yard radius blueberry patch. And last year, for example, I was hunting similar area where I saw that uh, chocolate bear and there was four bears and they weren't, it wasn't a sow with cubs. It was like four mature bears all within 150 yards of me, like eating this devil's club and all this brush. And, and they weren't really fighting. They were just like eating away and not bothering each other. But I, I do feel like they are, you know, territorial. Yeah. Yeah. They're such a neat animal. Like they're just so, yeah, I, I had a conversation with uh, a guy. Oh man, what was it? Maybe a month or two months ago, and we were talking about we were talking about. I I was telling him I was like, man, spot and stock bear hunting with a bow is you know is one of the harder animals to spot and stock. And he's he's going off about how oh freaking no 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 it's like they're easy they're easy to hunt. And like guy's not a bow hunter, do you know what I mean? Like he doesn't hunt with a bow, he hunts with a rifle. So like right there, I'm like, you know, and it, which is fine. You can hunt with whatever the fuck you want. You know, as long as it's legal, you can hunt with a blow dart if, for all I care. I'm not gonna judge you on what you hunt with, but man, those things are just that's what makes them so special, I think, for me anyway. Like, you know, and I tell people all the time, I'm like, man, you know, like you start thinking about your favorite animal to hunt and man, bears right up there with mule deer for me. Like obviously chasing those big big muley bucks is number one but i mean i just love the spring and that's like you know that's why i reached out to you i was like man i I gotta get dug on because i got i got the bear bug right now i appreciate it i i would like to talk to that guy because i I mean he he's right and he's wrong so like you know if if you're hunting a bear in the spring in a in a tidal flat that's wide open and you have your bow that's a stockable position you know it's Mm -hmm. it's Lots of times they're concentrated. If the wind's right, you can really get in there. Um, but if you're hunting them in Washington in the spring and, you know, the brush is six feet tall and thick and it looks like a Disney movie, you know, where you're, the prince is slapped away at the blackberry bushes. Yeah. That's a tough situation. I hunted bear probably 90% last season with my bow and I ended up not getting one. Um, not for not seeing them. I, I passed on like 15 of them, but it was just, you know, things just didn't line up perfectly with a bow when they have to, you know? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, and their, their senses are so keen. Like their sense of smell 
is so great. And like in the areas where you and I hunt, you get these, you know, you get these, you get these funny wind tunnels and they'll still just pull wind, you know, for no, you know, it could be 11 o'clock in the afternoon on a warm, nice day, the thermals are blowing up. And then all of a sudden you get a, a weird little wind swirl and it's blowing your stink all over the side of the mountain. And the bear you've been watching for three hours, all of a sudden puts his head up and he's gone two ridges over just like that. It's over. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, uh, who was it? Cl- uh, Clay Newcomb and uh, Steve Ranella, they were, they were hunting in Montana for spring bear. And they had that same problem. They were watching a bear. The bear was 800 yards away. And it was just like a puff of wind that kind of went that way. And you could see the bear just raised his nose. And, you know, uh, once the wind reached him, raised yeah. his nose, that thing was gone. And they were eight football fields away from that thing. Dude, my buddy and I were hunting. We were hunting bear and no shit, man. We, we were like, we we're over a kilometer away. And we were watching this bear. And we had an argument about him. I was like, dude, that bear winded us. And he's like, how the fuck can that bear wind us from this far? I'm like, dude, he winded us. Like, there's no reason for him. Like, we've been watching him here for an hour and a half. And he hasn't moved. All of a sudden, we get some wind blowing on our back. And, you know, he puts his head up and he's gone. And I'm like, well, what else would it be? Like, we looked around. Like, we stood there. And I'm like, there's no grizzlies around. Like, you know, sometimes you'll get a grizzly. He gets a whiff of a grizzly. He's going to be he's gonna be gone in no time. But, I mean, like... I was 100% sure, like 99% sure that that bear smelled us. And, you know, the guy, my buddy I was with, he, he didn't believe me. But I always like to bring that up when, when anti hunters will say, uh, oh, it's a poor defenseless bear. Well, you obviously don't know the meaning of defense or, or offense because the bear can smell, you know, 40 times greater than a bloodhound. They're stronger than us, they're faster than us. Um, you know, there's, they have plenty of defenses, trust me. Yeah. What it blows, blows me away and like, um, is how quiet an animal that big can be in the bush. Like I'm walking, you know, it's June last year and I'm looking for this big bear. I'm walking through the bush and it sounds like I'm walking on cereal because now everything that, you know, you get a good heat wave and it dries everything right out, all those leaves and stuff that are sitting on the ground. It sounds like I'm walking on cereal. You you see those bears, like I had bears. I had a bear walk right up behind me and I didn't even know he was there until he stood up and broke a branch and he stood and like, I'm like, holy fuck. Like if I, like, it's funny because I'm sitting there and I'm watching, I'm watching this draw waiting for these bears to start coming up. And all of a sudden I hear this little branch snap behind me and I turn around, there's a fucking bear 10, 15 yards away standing on both, you know, standing on two legs. I turn around and my bow was sitting on a tree. So I was like, I turned around first, didn't have my bow in my hand. I turned around, like, oh shit. I turn around right away. I grab my bow and then draw back. But by that time, the bear, he, he was gone. He's like, no, he, he didn't want anything to do with it. But like, if he wanted to, he could have just easily taken, you know, a couple quick strides and taken a bite out of me. But um, yeah, it's funny how quiet those are. That was the biggest thing I learned. I was blown away with last year was how like I I've obviously I know they're quiet and like I've sat I've sat in blinds and watched bears walk up but man when that bear snuck up on me I was like how the fuck did I not hear that bear because like walking it, into that one area it was loud so loud it, it I, I talk about that in the book too but like you know I can see how deer can be quiet because they're yeah. they're football you yeah, know what I mean exactly they're yeah. absolutely dainty animals and they're trying to be quiet and then yeah. bear they're heavy they're they got broad paws and it's just like how are you so quiet i had this one bear years ago before i even wrote any of these books or anything and he stood up i don't know he wasn't even he wasn't even 30 feet from me probably he stood up in this on this blackberry pile but it was you could see the bear upper half when he stood up and he saw me and i saw him we held still for five minutes and then he like just kind of got down and I kept waiting for him to to move I kept waiting for the brush to move for him to stand up I stood there for like 45 minutes before I started to move again but he didn't move a leaf like nothing I don't know how it's just like he melted away you know I actually hiked in there to make sure he wasn't laying down because I didn't see him move at all and he was just gone I was like this is that's insane yeah it blows me away but like you say I mean like a deer you know it's got pointy little hooves and it's it like a deer walks like it's trying to get killed all the time. You know what I mean? That's like a rabbit. You watch a rabbit walk and it's like, like everything wants to kill it. But like a bear, bear doesn't, it's just like, just a brood. It walks, but like, it's just blow. It blew me away how quiet I was. I was, I was, I was, I was driving home that night and I was like, oh man, I like, fuck man. I was kind of replaying in my head. I'm like, I got to be more, I got to be a little more careful here. I got to make sure that, you know, 
if I'm going to sit up and perch like that, I got to make sure there's, you know, some trees behind me. So one can't sneak up on me. Not that I'm worried about bears, but I mean, I, we got a lot of grizzly bears here too. And I mean, I don't, I'm not worried about grizzly bears to me. I mean, like most of the time the new grizzly bears are there and we don't even know it. You know, they, they don't like the smell of us. They don't even like, they don't like anything about us. So they leave the area as well. I, but I was talking to some Alaskan I, I, when I was up there, I don't remember who it was, but anyway, uh, they had said, they're like, grizzly bears don't grizzly bears and brown bears don't bother me black bears do because grizzlies and browns are very predictable and black bears you just can't they 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 are a lot less predictable and i can't really say yay or nay on that because i haven't been around a lot of grizz or a lot of browns um but you know i i I do i definitely have a healthy respect for black bear because of how quiet they are and you know like that if they want to jump you they can jump you well and that's what i always tell people too and they're like oh you're out hunting black bear and they're like, oh, at least it's not grizzly. And I'm like, well, does it really fucking matter? I mean, like a 300 pound black bear, it's, it's the only difference is you're just going to probably die a little slower while it's yeah. eating you than a, you know, a grizzly bear. He'll just, he'll probably just put you out of your misery quick. Or, you know, he, most of the time though, like with black bears, from what I've heard, I've never had experience. I've never been attacked by either, but from what I hear, like a black bear, you know, he, he, he'll get you down. He wants to, you know, he chew on your soft stuff. He'll pull your stomach apart and where a grizzly bear, he'll just, he just wants to be left alone. He's not necessarily going to eat you. So that's why they tell you to play dead. And then normally, most of the time, they leave you alone. But like, from what I've heard, like black bears, they don't do that. They'll just, they'll maul you to death. Yeah. I've, uh, let's see if I can find it really quick. I got a book right here called Bear Attacks and Their Causes and Avoidances. Oh, yeah. And uh, that's a really who good write, book. Who writes that book here? I'm going to write it down here. I'm going to put that in the show notes. It's uh, Stefan Herrero. So H-E-R-R-E-R-O. Beauty. And um, he he dissects a bunch of uh, bear attacks throughout North America and stuff. So that's really interesting to read. And yeah, you're right. It's like if a, if a black bear attacks you, it's predatory. They're trying to eat and kill you. And, and usually if a grizzly attacks you, it's you surprise them on a food cache or it's a mom with cubs and they just you know, want to pacify you. But the problem is when they, pacify you, they crush all your ribs and, you know. Yeah, yeah, just from their enormous size, it's just. Yeah. <laughs> but, so, it, yeah, it's always advised to, like, fight fight against black bears and play dead against brown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be, uh, that'd be quite the experience. You hear stories, like, you hear the occasional horror story about a black bear. I heard this one story about a black bear that had gone in into uh, – there was uh, some hunters and then the one black bear, he went, he went into, he crawled into uh, a wall tent that wasn't zipped open overnight. I guess, you know, how, you know, you know how like all the wall tents, the zippers, they got those galvanized zippers and uh, after a while they don't work. So they end up just getting ripped. And so anyway, they left them open and they were having this problem with his black bear in camp. And uh, finally one morning they, or one night the black bear got in and started eat, they started attacking the one guy that was sleeping. And it was, you know, ripping his stomach to shit and doing all like just tearing him apart. So the guy that was on the other side of the wall tent, he woke up, got his gun and he was trying to get a good shot. And he thought he had a good shot. And he, he shot that ended up shooting the guy. I think he shot him in the shoulder or something. So on top of getting attacked by a black bear, he got shot. But the bullet went through the bear, I'm pretty sure, and hit. But it also hit him. Uh, but uh, that's just a bad night. Oh, man. <laughs> if, he lived, if he lived, it'd be a good story, you know. But, yeah, I don't. I never heard the story. I don't. If I did, I don't remember if it uh, if there's anything, you know, if he lived or or if he passed. But uh, that'd oh. just be a horrible, horrible way. I don't know. Like, like I said, I've never had any issues with black bears. Most of the time, I've ever like I've had it. I've we we were actually um, goat and elk hunting in the Kootenays, and we got a little too close to uh, to an elk kill that a grizzly was on, and uh, he didn't want us there, so he took a run at us. Um, you know, black bears calling them, I find when you're calling them, they'll either do two things. They'll either um, come running in or they'll just, you know, they'll just keep doing what they're doing. Uh, I've never had a, never had really a, an issue with, with grizzly bears. A couple of times, you know, you get, leave garbage out and they'll get into the garbage, but nothing, nothing too most, crazy. Most of the time when I'm calling with black bear, I've, I've noticed either one of three things, either run in and, you know, they're just charging right in at you or... <laughs> they will uh sneak in real quiet and then you know you you look to your right and they're 20 yards away yeah it, but rarely do they ever just kind of saunter in it's usually like running or sneaking the last yeah. one i two years ago he acted really weird he just kind of walked on up like just was checking me out um yeah, that was yeah i had week. that one i had that one i think i was telling you about um 
I was calling, 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 and I got up and left too early. And then I, I was walking out of the trail and he was walking in, but he was just walking too. Like he wasn't running. He was just walking. And like, I was calling for a long time and I didn't see him when he was moving. So I don't like, I don't imagine he was running in. I think he was kind of just sauntering in at the slow pace, but yeah. in my experience, either they come right in or they just do their own. Like if I'm watching them and they'll just continue about their business, they're just not interested in it. So, um, yeah, but that's still, I'm, you know, that's a, that's a technique. That fawn call I showed you that I was telling you about, that works pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, about calling really quick, I, I've told people that before if they've, if they've listened, but you know, if you don't have, if you don't have, I, I, I can't say if you don't have fawns in your area, because every, every place in North America, it seems like has deer, oh, yeah. but if you jackrabbit uh, up where you live and you're not having luck calling, give that jackrabbit squeal a call because it's a, it's a different sound, you know, they might've mm-hmm. heard one call and been educated to it or a, or a cottontail or whatever it might be, but try something different, Havelina call. Um, anything to just pique that interest of those those bear to come running in. Yeah, I was listening to a couple of guys talk about um, using hog calls to call in bears, and they were saying it works, and they were kind of saying the same thing. They're like, well, and and that's the thing, you know, bears are really curious critters. Like, that's why they get into pretty much everything is because they're just curious, you know. They're just kind of do their own thing, and they're curious, and they just they want to investigate. So a lot of times when you throw those those calls whether you think they're going to work or not or if there's even if there's not like around here there's no hogs in the area but be interesting to see i think i'm going to give that a whirl this year i'll find a hog haul and i'll just when i see some bears i'll just start blowing on it. or try a coyote pup distress i've called bears in with that just doing you know yips oh, winter. Really? yeah 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 that'd be uh i guess why not i mean really i mean to them they're you know they're just scrounging for food so if it's a dog or an ungulate what difference does it make yeah no they don't care <laughs> no, no, they're not picky. That's for sure. Oh, so uh, what's your bow setup for like for bow or for bear? Uh, it's seventy pound draw. I have one hundred and twenty five grain uh, Montec G five solid broadhead. Yeah. Uh, I don't know the weight of my arrow off the top of my head, but it's been the same for whatever I've had it for for the last oh twenty years. Yeah, what, what's your draw length? Uh, I don't know. I, I'm not, uh, not buddy, you're probably, you're probably like a 28 or 29, I think. Cause I think we're on the same size and I'm 20, I'm like 20, I'm like, I'm right between, I figure like right between 20 and a half and 29, depending on the bow I'm shooting. I find I either got to do one or the other. Um, but you're probably, you're probably shooting. I imagine like around a 500 total weight arrow. I know Riverside archery in Skagit County could tell you because those are the people I go to. And so like, if I need anything, I'm just like, oh yeah, you know, they'll measure my. If I need a new string or whatever, they'll measure me and throw it on there. And yeah, so those I, guys are good. I talked to those guys a couple of times because, like, up here in Canada, you, if you want anything, like trying to find it is next to impossible. Really? Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to find specific. Like, if you're specific, and you know, when it comes to archery gear, I'm very archery gear. I'm very specific on like what I like and like what colors I want to shoot and like, you know, just. You know, I'm just I'm just that kind of way when guy when it comes to archery. And then I was talking to, I was emailing back and forth with some guy from Riverside, and because uh, I seen something on their website and they said it's out of stock. And I, I sent them a quick email, and they're like, "No, no, we got some. We'll send some out right away." It was actually some I was looking for some yellow hybrid veins from AA. So they they hooked me up. And see, like like me, I, I I'll go there and I'll buy arrows and and the, you know, hey, what color do you want? I'm like, I don't care. You know, just yeah. give, me, give me arrows, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And, I'm shooting my little brother's bow that I, he gave to me as a hand me down or a hand me up, I guess. You know, it's it's got to be 15, 20 years old. I bring that in there and they kind of laugh at me. They're like, "Man, you're still shooting this thing?" I'm like, yeah, you know, still <laughs> well, kills up. Oh yeah, man. If it works, I mean, it is what it is, and all depends what you're comfortable. You don't like coming from me, the guy who gets a, a bow or two every year. Like, you don't need those. I mean, I don't. You know, it's not going to make you a better shooter. I mean, obviously, with the new technology as it comes out it's definitely nice to shoot the new stuff because it's just so much better but i mean like look at fred bear man he was killing more than critters than anyone with his his old freaking you know bow and string or stick and string i think it i mean it's like it's what you're comfortable with it's same with my rifle like i have a 300 winchester short magnum and sometimes i'll bring a lever action or something uh out bear hunting but that 300 winchester short magnum out you know i bust brush with it it's just it's yeah. muscle memory it's just you know it's like just part of you you just you're so used to it i don't even think about anything when i shoot i just I'm, yeah you know. yeah and, and that's what it's all about it's not about it it's just 
it's muscle memory. You need it when it's time, when it's go time, you want to make sure that you're comfortable and you're familiar with what you're doing. That's why like the, in the military, that's their, you know, that's, that's why they practice everything millions and millions and millions and make it like repetition all of a sudden becomes reality. It's just come second nature to them. I remember we had, I had, uh, um, Rourke Denver on him and I were talking about that. He was talking about, he's like, yeah, it's, it's, you know, by the time you get to war, you feel like you've done it a million times just because it's, you know, it's just muscle memory at that time. You've done it, you know, a million times you've done this one, this one movement. So by the time it comes in, you need it. It's just, it's like you said, it's just muscle memory. It's just second nature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool, man. So, uh, yeah. Um, what else I got for you? Yeah, I kind of just wanted to go over, you know, I just wanted to, well, I mean, I just, we were talking back and forth at Christmas time there and I said, man, I got to get dug on again, but uh, I kind of just wanted to go over, you know, some of the, some of the basics of, you know, what you're doing right now. And I, I when you were coming on here the other day, I picked up your book and I was looking through your book and I was like, oh, I gotta, it's been a while since I, I went through your book and the very first, uh, the very first chapter is on preseason scouting, which is great. And I was like, oh man, that's a great topic. So, you know. Hey, have you ever thought about doing an audio book? You know, I've, I've had people ask me um, that. And and because I was hired by my publisher to write The Ultimate Guide, I'd have to clear it with them to be able to, you know, put it out there. I don't think they'd be against it. But uh, uh, I, I, I have thought about it. I haven't really explored it too much. Um, but I'm, I'd be open to it. So, yeah, hey, I mean, if there's somebody listening out there who, who needs something written and they want me to read it, you know, I can bring out my commercial voice if you really want me to. <laughs> well, I, I just asked because, you know, like right now I'm kind of like I'm totally into these audiobooks, And it's kind of funny because like before, I, for some reason, I was just like, ah, it's, I, I was kind of like, I don't know. I, I wasn't I just felt like I wasn't doing the, the book or the author justice if I didn't spend the time to read what he wrote. Do you know what I mean? And then ah. I started all of a sudden I like. I just somehow I just accidentally got into listening to these auto books and now it's like, fuck man, I'm just like addicted to them. Right. I started listening, like I'm going through all Jocko's books and like, um, yeah, it's just, they're awesome. And it's funny. Like, I don't know. Uh, I'm sitting there and I'm like, man, I don't know why it took me so long to get on this train, but it's, yeah, it's, they're great. I mean, you could like driving in your truck for work or, you know, going to the range or anything. You can just, you can just absorb that information. Yeah, it's like you know, it's like listening to podcasts. It's listening yeah. to TEDs for a couple, you know, for an hour or however long you're going to do it. Um, I I find that when I listen to audio books, I I get more distracted than I do with podcasts. Well, because usually what I'm listening to is, um, if I do, it would be like a fantasy book, like Lord of the Rings or something to that effect. And so I'm I'm kind of absorbed in it in my head. And so I, yeah. I um, it's not necessarily good for me to listen to it while I drive. Me personally. Um, but you know, like with podcasts, it's like listening to the radio. Lots of times you can just kind of, you pick it up now and again, or yeah. 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 I find with the podcast, they, um, obviously, I mean, everybody has their favorite podcast and there's so many good podcasts out right now. And we were talking about this on the last episode is how many more podcasters are now, even when I started doing podcasts, how many more podcasts there are, are now. And I mean, they're all great. The more, the better. Um, but I find with the podcast, I just. Yeah, I, I, I'm more tuned into an audiobook than I am. I, I, I shouldn't say that. It may, it, maybe it's not, you know, if I went through an audiobook that so far that I didn't, you know, wasn't really into, I probably would feel the same. But it's just the ones I've listened to so far, I've they were kind of on my to do my to read list too. So um, maybe that's why, because I have, I'm pretty sure I have all the, all the ones that, all the books I've been listening to. I'm pretty sure I have, I have those books on my shelf collecting dust. So. Now at least I can say I know what uh, what's going on in the book, even though I haven't read it. I I should ping my publisher and just be like, "Hey, look, I can record this all on my own and just upload it to Amazon. What do you say? And just see what they say." Yeah, yeah, I know. And like we we had another guest on too, um, you know, um, and he just got his book published in man, I want to say 2019, and yeah, he just did an audio book, and yeah, he said it took him a couple of days. He's you know, it's quite it's quite a da daunting process. From what i hear but i mean he said the 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 turnout has has been really good so and i know that now they 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 sell it on amazon and there's so many you know audio that audio uh audio book and all this stuff so i yeah i was just curious if you ever did i went and it's funny because i picked up your book today off my bookshelf and i was thinking i was like man i doug should do an audio book that'd be great because um i bet you a lot of guys would buy it they'd love it 
probably if they could put up with my voice. I'd need to hire. I'd want to hire like uh, Samuel L. Jackson or somebody. You know, good. No, to- man, you can't. You can't do that, man. Like, cause I I remember like I've I've listened to other like now that I've one of the first books I listened to was or on audio was uh, Goggins' book, and uh-huh. and he he had somebody else read it, and um. I didn't like it as much. And same with uh, the Total Recall, like the biography on Arnold Schwarzenegger. I listened to that one too. And he had somebody else read it. And But like Arnold would read a couple chapters and then the other guy would fill in. But like it was way better, even though like you could barely understand some of what Arnold was saying with his, you know, just with his accent. It was still yeah. 100% better than, uh, than, you know, than it was when somebody else was reading it, like the actual authors read. Now I remember I was talking to Ty from Wilderness Lo- Locals and he was talking about audiobooks. And maybe this is why I started listening to him, but he was saying he listened to Renella's, Renella's Buffalo book and he, somebody else was reading it. And then Renella redid it. And it was a, like a hundred to hundred times better when Renella did it. When the actual author does it, I find it more, I find it a lot I think, better. I think Renella has a good voice. Uh, you know, he has a good radio voice. He has a good TV voice. He's a good narrator. You know? Well, yeah. Well, and he's, uh, I mean, he's, you know, like he's, a, he's a, an amazing ambassador for, for hunters all over the world. And yeah, I mean, he's, he's articulates himself really well and he's, he's really outspoken. Yeah. No, he, he definitely does have a good, really good voice. For sure. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, I think, uh, yeah, I think uh, the ultimate guide to black bear hunting would be right up there though. You give him a run for his money. Yeah, I, I, but it's funny that when you when you say that, I've looked at it on Amazon, and you know, I keep track of sales and stuff like that. And and now and again, not so much recently, so it's been out for a while. But now it, I have pictures of it, you know, like right under Steve Rinella's book, or right next to, uh, uh, you know, like Teddy Roosevelt's book or something like that. It's just yeah, kind yeah. of that same. Yeah, group. Matt, oh, dude, it yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, sure. you know, the, yeah, it. But I mean, you know, when it comes to black bears and just you know hunting as an uh, as a, a voice you're right up there with them as well and well, i appreciate uh, how, how, how was the you were on the meat eater podcast you were on with jason phelps how was that yes sir uh, that was good it was a lot of fun um i haven't sorry i haven't had a chance to uh to listen to it yet i remember when you were going on we were talking and then it was gonna air it was airing later uh and then i yeah i, I just kind of slipped my mind that one's all yeah um it was cool too because like so there's a website called huntingwashington.com and I, I used to be on that a lot kind of before everything. Um, and, and Jason was on there too. And then, and I kind of watched him start his, his company and, you know, he started out small, like anybody else. He started out just out of his house, out of his garage or however yeah. it may be. And, and, you know, we talk now and again on, on there. So it was just a couple of schmucks online BSing, and then to see him get to where he is now running the podcast and and working with meteor and stuff like that it was just it was it was a good talk it was um a good talk we talked a lot about predator calling and it was just neat to see his growth i guess yeah yeah Yeah, he kind of transitioned that that podcast that platform to more like a call more like in his expertise like towards more calling didn't he from like where i know remy warren was doing it before and it was a little you know, is that the baseline was a little different than it is now where he's yeah, more. I, yeah. I think he kind of made it his own, you know, mediator allowed him to kind of transition that from, from what Remy was doing, which was great. You know, Remy is incredible in his own right. Um, and yeah, to focus a bit more on calling and, and yeah, and, well that, yeah, that's kind of his bread and butter. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So any, uh, yeah, no doubt. What, uh, how was your fall? Fall was good. Um, you know, I, I passed on 15 bear, um, uh, family members got s- some good animals. I got a nice uh, three three point with eye guards. It was a twenty four inch wide muley. Got him opening morning mm-hmm. at like oh I don't even think it was two hundred yards. It was, it, it, but when I say two hundred yards for me, that's a far shot. Most of my shots, even on mule deer, are like fifty yards or less. They're usually not far, and that's with a rifle. Um, so it, it was kind of funny. We we get to the spot, me and my son, and I get to my glassing knob where I kind of overlook this big kind of rocky valley area. And I says, well, Hayden, you know, take a left, go over that ridge and see what you see. And, and I'll stay here in glass. And uh, it was so smoky that day that I really couldn't glass that well. So I was like, ah. anyway, I, I look over to my left and Hayden's walking away and there's a four point coming over the ridge kind of toward us. I'm like, Hayden, there's a four point. And, and when I turned my head to look at Hayden, I lost sight of, sight of the four point, but I think he went back over the ridge. And anyway, Hayden went back over the ridge and disappeared. 
And then a few minutes later, I hear a shot. And so I'm texting him, hey, did you shoot? If you did, stay where you're at, you know, blah, blah, blah. He goes, oh, I, I, I missed. And I go, well, you know, walk over there, make sure that you missed. And um, he walked over and, and made sure he missed. There was no hit, no nothing. And uh, while I'm while I'm digging on the phone, not glassing or anything, because it's too smoky, I look over and here's that that three point and he's just coming over the ridge where Hayden kind of just came from, but he's downhill quite a ways. And I thought, well, if he gets in between these two trees, I'm just going to let him have it. And so it wasn't five minutes after Hayden shot that I shot. And then I text Hayden and, and I says, uh, Hey, I, I didn't miss. We have work to do. And he said, yes, you know, <laughs> yeah. he came back. But what had happened was is he went over that ridge, saw that four point that was bed down and he's 18. He's, he's been hunting for quite a while, but, um, you know, he's young, he got buck fever and he, he went to take his pack off and he get kind of set up and the, and the buck saw him and stood up and then Hayden got nervous and kind of rushed a shot and clean yeah. miss and just kind of walked off, you know, it was fine, but it was fun. It was great to, to have him there with me. Um, for one, he's 18. He could help me pack it out, which was great. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it was great. Great. Uh, great season. Yeah. That was a nice muley tag there. I seen that there. Congratulations. It's good. Thanks. Yeah. So, but, uh, what's that? Oh, I was going to say, but, uh, you know, that was, that was the only legal buck I saw. I think that season, cause I, I stuck around and I, I hunted bear and then I helped, you know, family bring deer out and stuff like that. So we had a few more in camp that got taken, but it was kind of the slim pickings this year for the most part over on Eastern Washington where I was hunting. Yeah, I feel that feel like that's kind of like well, like Washington BC is kind of that's kind of like the common theme for mule deer. I mean, we don't see nearly as much mule deer as we used to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, other than the ones that the crows are picking on, a, picking at at the side of the road. Um, I saw I saw this one buck in camp. So I was at my dad's property in between Twisp and Winthrop, and I was glassing this this rocky hill. And, uh, the day before I saw a wolf in the cliffs, I'd never seen a, a wolf in the cliffs. I thought it was a cougar at first. And this is like two miles away. It's, it's a ways off and I'm looking at it through my vortex and I can tell it's a dog and, uh, definitely a wolf. But anyway, it scurries down and kind of hides out. Well, the, the next day is when I saw this buck and he had tucked himself his butt up into the cliffs. And he's like, what, what drew me to him was all these magpies were like, dive bombing him oh really uh, yeah i was like what the heck is going on and, and finally he got irritated by these things and he really slowly walked down the hill and then bed down and then and then tucked into kind of a, a ditch or a slope but he was he was hurt somehow or another and these birds were just pestering the heck out of him and the next day he was gone and i don't know if the wolf got him because the wolf was kind of right in that area yeah uh, or what but it was just it was savage you know it was like the the nature is metal um instagram page yeah. birds were just you know that trying to get his eyes and and they were they were on his back picking that that wound on his back and he was trying to get him with his with his rack you know but it was just oh poor it, guy it, i hate to see an animal suffer like that oh. i hate to see we seen well sorry i shouldn't say we but um, my mom seen, she took a uh, little, like a little video clip of it. Coyotes, they tracked down a young deer and they were eating it from the back end. It was still alive. It was trying to crawl. It couldn't crawl. They were eating its stomach. My mom said she was so sick. And I was like, what the fuck do you think they do? Like, and they were pulling it across the ice, across the river from her, from their place, trying to get it back up the hillside. And the thing was still alive and it's just, you know, it's pull, trying to pull itself on the ice and they're just, the coyotes are dragging and it's bleeding everywhere. And yeah, like nature's cruel, man. Like an arrow through the heart or through the lung, it'll, you know, that's a lot more humane than that. Jesus. Oh, yeah. I, I was working at a, at a flower plant years ago, flower meaning like what you cook with. And there was, there was a seagull that got hurt in the parking lot and, a busted wing or something so it's flopping around and for three days this thing's out in the parking lot and and now it's like surrounded by these gulls and they're like picking at it it's trying yeah. to defend it ain't gonna make it and it's lunchtime i just put down my lunch and i go out there and i grab a two by four and i just smash that thing's head in and then i go back in and i start eating lunch and like my co-workers were thought i was a serial killer or something they're like oh my god they were mouths wide open like eyes <laughs> but i'm just doing it for man like it's not gonna end well for that poor seagull well, uh, that's it, right? And like, man, it's funny. We were having this conversation. It's funny. We were having this conversation at Christmas dinner and we were talking about like, I remember when I was a, a youngster and we had our, our neighbor across the street and we were cruising with him. And then 
there was a deer that had got hit and the lady had pulled over and this deer was flopping around on the side of the road. And so he got out and he's looking at this deer and the deer is clearly suffering. He goes into this, into his uh, truck, grabs the knife, walks up, slits the deer's throat, drags it down, you know, off this road onto the side, into the ditch. And he jumps back in his truck, cleans his knife, puts it, puts it away. And that was it. Right. And they're like, Oh, imagine if you did that now, (laughs) what would happen? Like, (laughs) <laughs> like he'd be going to jail like and it's funny it's like he didn't kill the deer the deer's like it's just sitting there it's dying and the lady's freaking out she's in tears and then he goes walks up and just grabs a knife slits its throat and like it's dead within 10 seconds right it's yeah it's, just up. yeah it's way more peaceful death than what it was going through what it was going to go through sitting there on the side of the road kicking while birds are picking at its eyes while it's still alive and eating at its wounds like but I, I just remember we were having this conversation where it was like, it was a funny Christmas con- conversation to have a Christmas dinner, but it was like, imagine what those get what would happen now. Like that'd be it. Like there'd be so many cameras out and like, fuck, it would just be all over. Like, look at this guy. Like, but I mean, like, how, like that, that's just what they did. And I like, you know, that's just how it was done back in the day. It's funny. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That poor lady, though. Yeah, I can still remember the look on her face when he did that. <laughs> My bro, he had a he had a deer tag once. He was driving home, and I, I like a a deer got hit on the highway side of a highway. It wasn't quite dead, but it was it was on its way out. And you can't dispatch it. You have to wait for the thing to die because probably they don't want you shooting alongside a highway or something like that. But you're not supposed to. You're not supposed to kill it anyway. A, a stater showed up and. I think the stater ended up putting it out of its misery, but he didn't even know like where to shoot. My brother had to kind of tell him. And uh, it was like the, the the last night of deer season. My brother just put his tag on it. This was before they had a salvage, a salvage permit uh, type of thing. But my brother was like, Hey, I got a deer tag. Can I just tag it and, you know, throw it in my truck? And the stater was like, yeah, go ahead. You know, at least it's not in the road causing trouble. So. Well, brother, at least, at least it doesn't go to waste. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing too. Now, yeah. nowadays, salvage permits which is good you know because heck i've picked up i saw a, a three you know four point black tail got hit on i-5 a, a, a bmw hit it and that you know broke its leg and a couple of ribs went in its lungs but other than that the deer was perfect and i i took that home yeah yeah see up here we're not allowed to do anything like that like i i think what they think is you're going to be taking you know your sixty thousand dollar vehicle and deliberately clipping deer perfectly so they die Thank- and don't destroy all the meat. Thankfully, the beamer in front of me did that for me, so I could just. <laughs> the yeah. Total beamer was done. Yeah, I remember when we were young and we were driving. My dad hit a deer, and I tell you, uh, that's not something I'd want to do deliberately because there was a lot of fucking damage to his truck, and that deer was mangled. Yeah. I'm not getting any like burger. That's about it. But <laughs> I wouldn't want to be eating it. Well, anyway, buddy. Um, thanks for coming on again. Appreciate yeah, we got kind of topic there, but that's okay. I mean. Whatever. Yeah, you know, and I, I just I thought I'd touch base and uh you know I, I kind of well there's kind of wanted to go over you know some just key key points of pre preseason scouting, which I think we touched on. So that's good. And you know, when it gets closer to bear season, I think maybe uh I'll bug you to hop back on and we'll, we'll go over, you know, the 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 usual bear hunting stuff. When guys are uh when it's a little, you know, when it's actually in the bear season for some reason, I, fi- I find guys are a little more they'll, they'll absorb it a little more, but you know, for the, for the diehards like you and me, and like I said, I already have bear on the brain. So who better to talk, uh, to talk bear with than yourself? No, man, I appreciate it. And anytime you want me back on, I'm happy to do it anytime. Cool, for any- yeah. And, uh, I'll throw all the show notes up your book. I mean, this is the time to get it too, guys. You know, the audio book's not going to come out for a while. So, uh, go to Amazon. You can do com CA ultimate guide to black bear hunting um you got lots of time to read it before august or april first yeah april first here in bc uh, depending on where you're hunting from for spring bears so uh get it now get that information and put it to use it works thank you until yeah, until, what... until the audio book right i'll uh maybe i'll get cam haynes to read it for me i seen he had <laughs> yeah. a, a book out i haven't read it yeah he did he did his uh his endure all right i think he's called endure yeah and he, he read it Oh yeah, a good book. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is. It's a good book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. perseverance and hard work. What he's all about. I call. I actually call you the uh, the Canadian campaign. Yeah, yeah. I don't know about that. Okay, buddy. We'll uh, right. we'll talk to you later, man. All right. Yeah, have a good rest of your day.
Okay, guys, I want to thank you again for tuning into the Focus Hunting Podcast. It's coming at you as part of the Waypoint Outdoor Collective. Quick shout out to the sponsors of this show Vortex Optics, the best in optics, period. AKU Boots, yo to your feet. Now, if you guys go check out the uh, show notes, um, you're going to find some promo codes, use them, save a bunch. And uh, if you guys could please leave us a rating or review, we really appreciate that. And uh, until next time, love you guys.